Hey, it's Mike here, and today, are there genes that make it impossible to go vegan? Could a carnitine gene mutation make you need to be more carnivore? Could that famous mother effer gene perhaps require you to eat animal products? Could it be more dangerous to eat certain plants if you are lacking copies of a digestive enzyme gene? Over the years, I've heard many people voice concern over vegan diets and genetics from articles like this one and this one from Texas, all the way back a few years to Z-Dog and his What the Health documentary debunk. They're saying this is true for everyone. It's not, everybody's genetics are different. So we're gonna look at those particular genes which claims are made about. We're also gonna look a little bit at different ethnicities. For example, we're gonna look at the Inuit and if they have some genetic predisposition to not be vegan. This video is also a partnership with Vivo Life, which has a bunch of amazing products. And we're going to be doing a taste test of this golden turmeric latte with lion's mane mushroom really quickly. But just for those who wanna know right now, my link below automatically gives you 10% off your entire first purchase as a customer, so let's just go. The first gene that makes it impossible to go vegan is the psychopath gene because you just can't care about animals. Oh, I'm trolling hard. Actually, in order to be vegan, you have to have troll genes which I apparently have. But let's actually start off with this article out of Texas because it makes several claims about certain genes that would prevent somebody from being able to go vegan. It says, vegan lifestyle may not be appropriate for everyone, no, that they might have a genetic predisposition and they list vitamin A conversion, gut microbiome, and amylase levels. Starting with microbiome, I have yet to see any compelling case around this. We know that your whole biome can change dramatically in just 24 hours by eating a whole bunch of those high fat animal products that changes for the worst. Vegans generally have a better biome profile in terms of less potentially pathogenic and more beneficial bacteria. I don't think a strong case is made for gut biome, but let's move on to that amylase. As many of you know, we have salivary amylase. And the concern here, I guess, is that people vary in the number of copies of AMY1, the salivary amylase gene. The idea is if you would have a very small amount, then you wouldn't be able to digest starch and therefore couldn't go vegan, I guess is what they're saying. There's many issues with this, especially because a large portion of our amylase is made by the pancreas, so it could be digested further down anyway. Another issue is that if you have a very low amount of copies, you're still making salivary amylase to a reasonable degree, looking to this chart. The variation is not insane, but that person at one copy is not making zero amylase. They still do, and then add that pancreatic amylase on top of that. And I guess the down the line concern is that people would be eating all the starch on a vegan diet. By the way, people eat starch on a non-vegan diet anyway, and that could be contributing to diabetes because they're not like processing it well. Well, looking to this study, which was asking about this. They divided people into groups by their number of copies. We're talking one to four, five to six, seven to nine, and people with 10 or more. And they found that AMY1 copy number was not associated with glucose, insulin, or insulin resistance. But they also found that there could be a protective effect by eating higher starch in terms of diabetes if you have 10 or more. So maybe an added bonus. But having a low amount doesn't seem to hurt things here and add to that that vegans have about an 80% lower risk of all diabetes that I just don't think that this is a real concern. Moving on. Next is vitamin A. I've talked about this conversion before and it's the case that beta carotene that you're getting from plants needs to be converted into actual vitamin A in your body and there is a genetic variation around this. And in case people are concerned, vitamin A deficiency's first symptom according to the WHO is night blindness. For people who are getting paranoid that can't see well at night, it also tends to get worse as you get older so Stop panicking. And obviously anybody on any diet should consult their doctor around any of these. This is not medical advice. Do I still need to say that? Anyway, this is all about variations on the BCM01 gene. And it appears that some people who are worst off have about a 69% reduced ability to convert beta carotene to vitamin A. And that sounds really bad. Oh my gosh, they're so much worse than everybody else. Like, oh, 99% of the population is probably good. That is not the case. Putting this into context, nearly half of the population doesn't have ideal conversion. So about 45% of the population might be between 50 and 60% less effective than 
the most effective other half of the population. This is kind of confusing. But the point here is that the worst converters are only slightly worse than like half of the population. It isn't some like 1% or 10% of people that just would never be able to convert enough vitamin A. And add to that, that a lot of these beta carotene containing plant foods are just wildly over the daily value. So if you really are like three or four times worse at converting than some other people, just eating 200 calories of sweet potato is 15 times the daily value. So it's no surprise that looking to studies like this one on vegans, I wish they were bigger, but we're seeing no difference in vitamin A actual blood levels. And probably half of those people are not as good as other people are at converting vitamin A. And I have heard some people be concerned about people with low conversion getting too much beta carotene, but as this paper mentions, beta carotene doesn't really seem to be the concern for higher levels, unless it's like fake supplement situation. You no, know, they say actually the preformed vitamin A, even from the diet is more of a concern and it has been associated with adverse effects on health if consumed in high amounts, including, you know, some increased hip fracture risk. And if somebody has some fear around this and it's actually keeping them from being vegan, well, guess what, checkmate, you can also just take preformed vitamin A that is vegan and this is a total coincidence, Vivo Life's Multinutrient actually has preformed vegan vitamin A, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to do a taste test. Let's start by cracking it open. Apparently I just need to add some hot water. So you can do plant milk or water. I did water, probably would be better with plant milk. So maybe you can see this. Is this geometrically possible for me? Am I gonna spill this just showing you? There you go, you can see it. That's, that's pretty orange. Gotta love the turmeric. Oh, it's hot. Good. It's definitely better than the turmeric drink I make. Also tastes like it has no heavy metals because they do heavy metal testing, which is cool and gives you some peace of mind. Also chose to work with this company because this packaging is compostable. They also have a bunch of other awesome products that I will try out on video in the future. And they do things like plant a tree for every order. Good stuff. Anyway, you can click the link below, which will already have my code typed in there for first time customers to get 10% off their entire order. All right, let's keep going. All right, next up we have the mother effer gene because it's so bad to have. And I feel like this has been highly marketed. It's sort of edgy and new, at least it was a couple of years back and it leads to a bunch of supplement companies and testing companies getting involved. And I even found this write up where this girl said she can't be vegan anymore, largely citing the mother effer gene <laughs> as a reason. And it's worth mentioning that everybody has the mother effer genes, it's just a matter of what variations you have. And of course, some are less efficient than others. The main concern here is around folate or B9, B12 is something we'll talk about in a second. But as the CDC says, the mother effer gene provides instructions for your body to make the mother effer protein, which helps your body process folate. Yes, it methylates folate so that you can use it. You of course want normal levels of folate for many reasons, including lowering homocysteine in the blood. High homocysteine levels can contribute to heart disease. And the concern here is specifically having two copies of the T variant would be the worst case scenario in which you have about 25% of the enzyme action for methylating that folate. And all these things sound really scary, but when you're actually measuring people on the ground, people with the TT combination, the worst combination, from the CDC only have 16% lower folic acid levels. And in case you're wondering about how it's broken down through ethnicities across the world, you can see this sort of low res map, sorry, but for some populations like Italy, and Hispanic people tend to have around 20% prevalence for the TT combination. And just an observation, it makes sense since beans are high in folate, that these are both bean consuming cultures that it just wouldn't really matter to have a little bit less of that methylation of folate because you're consuming way more. Simple example, you're gonna get about your daily requirement of folate by a cup of mashed pinto beans, so. And there's a little bit of an argument that having that double TT methylation thing could actually make somebody do better on a vegan diet because B12 supplementation is so widespread now on a vegan diet. And that is that people with that TT combination tend to have a higher B12 deficiency rate 
eating meat, of course, because that's the average diet. And so even with meat, people could have a harder time getting to the normal level. So by going on to a vegan diet, you would be eating way more folate. I mean, from this study, we see about four and a half times lower rate of folate deficiency for vegans compared to people who ate meat. So add that on top of the regular supplementation of B12, which again is recommended for everybody over the age of 40 anyway, and you could be better off. And I have heard people say, oh, if you have this gene, you have to take methylcobalamin for B12, but from this study, it appears that even cyano helped people with the TT gene out, and maybe it's a little bit better, but it's not required. And just in case you're wondering, Vivo Life has methylated B12. <laughs> anyway, now let's move on to the shocking carnitine case that was mentioned in the literature. And that really has to do with a primary carnitine deficiency. This is a genetic mutation that makes you basically worse at transporting carnitine throughout the body. Dr. Greger covered the 12 year old kid who was in and out of the hospital even on a meat-based diet and then by going vegetarian was worse off. And the solution either way was to be taking carnitine supplements. And again, they can be made vegan even though it has the word carn in it, which is meat. And this is super rare, like one in 50,000. And ironically, since this can lead to like some glycemic issue episodes, the recommendation is for kids who have this to be eating a high carbohydrate diet with extra starchy food. So you're supposed to take carnitine anyway, and then a vegan diet has more of those starchy foods, which could help even things out. Anyway, now moving on to some just general views about ethnicity. A lot of people have claimed, oh, I'm from a Northern area genetically, therefore I would be eating less plants and eating more meat, and so I couldn't be vegan. First of all, your average white person is from a more Northern area as well, and yet a lot of these vegan health studies are on those people, and they do really well. For example, in the the Ornish study and in Esselstyn study, we see great outcomes in terms of heart disease in people who are from these Northern climates by eating plant-based. And this brings me to the Inuit and other Arctic Circle populations. Oh, they probably adapted to eating super high meat and they could never ever be vegan, otherwise their body would just like fail. Well, it's worth mentioning that of the 300,000 years of Homo sapien history, only about 15 or 20 of those were across the Bering Strait into you know where the Inuit are in America. So the amount of time for genetic adaptations is actually relatively short. That doesn't mean they didn't happen. I've talked about how they're genetically adapted to not go into ketosis as easily, ironically, despite keto people citing them as a reason to be keto. And then there are some other genes we have here related to fat. From Science News, they have a gene variant that not only helps them metabolize fat in the diet more easily, but People with these genes do not stop metabolizing fatty acids just because carbohydrates are available, which is unusual. But this is purely a macronutrient thing. Doesn't really matter if it's animal or plant fat. They also have another gene variant that helps lower their LDL with higher fat consumption. However, that also exists in like 15% of Chinese people as well. So it's not like some unique trait. So there doesn't appear to be any you have to never be vegan gene that people in the Arctic Circle have. And for example, just totally anecdotal, there is a woman here that says, you know, growing up, she never liked the high meat diet that she was fed, always liked the plants and then decided to go vegan. You know, she didn't melt or anything, but I would have to say even with those LDL related genes, it's not a good heart disease situation for the Inuit and even Inuit mummies before modernization had pretty much the highest level of atherosclerosis of any mummies in the world. So not as adapted as they probably would like to be anyway. Now I think we just need to flip it and reverse it because there are a lot of genetic predispositions that are actually a, a pretty strong argument for going vegan in particular, heart disease and obesity related genes. I actually happen to be 90th percentile for obesity risk. Thankfully, um, not eating a ton of animal fat, <laughs> that would promote that more. We also have Alzheimer's genes, which is of course a cholesterol transport gene and heart disease genes. Again, a lot of these have to do with cholesterol. And as you've heard before, genetics are the low, <clears throat> genetics load the gun, but diet pulls the trigger by eating less animal fat and having lower cholesterol, eating lower saturated fat. You are less likely to have that trigger pulled by your diet. It's also worth mentioning in the plant-based studies of Dr. Dean Ornis, you see a big change in gene expression for the better in hundreds of genes, which is just really cool. And a lot of people with genetics like me, super white skin and blue eyes, we are more sensitive to UV radiation, yet a high carotenoid vegan diet would actually protect a little bit. Again, those carotenoids get into your eyes and your skin and help with UV. 
And there's one more thing some people might be wondering about, and that is blood type, which is of course genetic. And some people say, oh, if you have O blood type, you have to eat a bunch of meat because that's what your ancestors did. I have a whole video on this, but long story short, these studies looking at blood type and health outcomes showed no meaningful connection. So this claim just can't really be made. In the end, there doesn't appear to be an I can't go vegan gene. There doesn't appear to be an ethnic group on the planet that would be incapable of going vegan. Yeah, there are of course social issues for indigenous tribes and various ethnic groups in developing nations that would be a topic for an entirely different video. But particular genes, whether they have to do with fat metabolism, starch digestion, the mother effort gene, vitamin A conversion, and on and on and on. Either there is such a rare issue that you would have to be supplementing anyway so that your diet wouldn't make a difference, or these particular gene variations are just not a real world concern. Yeah, everybody should make sure they're getting enough beta carotene, it's a great antioxidant, getting enough folate, it's great for many reasons. And in terms of those starch copies, there doesn't appear to be a difference with insulin resistance and glucose and on and on. And let me know if there are any genes of concern that I did not cover in this video. I will be happy to research them. And once again, you can just click the link below to automatically have that 10% off your first entire order applied for Vivo Life. And I'm looking forward to doing more taste tests in future videos, but that's it. Feel free to like, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. And thank you for watching.